Let's try and find a practical use for these e-cores. So with 12th gen, Intel was kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. On the one hand, they knew that anything over eight cores for gaming had extreme diminishing returns. On the other hand, they also kept seeing Linus and the mainstream tech tubers constantly use Cinebench for CPU comparisons. So the reality was it didn't matter that the gamers were getting screwed over left, right, and center. We got these crappy chiplet architectures with a million cores that sucked for gaming. Intel couldn't release good products because they kept getting hammered by the mainstream because of lack of cores, right? Anyone who actually played games didn't really give a shit about those cores. We just want the fastest, lowest latency CPU that we could get. So. In came the 12th gen E-Cores, which was Intel's ingenious solution to the problem. So now when Linus presses the go button on this thing, those little cores kick on. Now it doesn't lose in Cinebench anymore. That is literally the only function of these things, by the way, just to not lose benchmarks. So literally in every circumstance as a gamer, if you're only playing games, you disable those little things and you get a way, way, way better gaming CPU with just eight big cores. But here is the other problem that you find on the internet, a sort of buyer's remorse, kind of. People wanna leave the e-cores enabled. Despite, even if it hampers performance, people feel like they paid for it. I paid for all those cores, I'm gonna be using all those cores. Even though they don't use all the cores, they want to leave them enabled and they will find any excuse on the planet to leave them enabled so that they don't feel like they're disabling half of their chip. For me personally, I couldn't care less. I just want the most frames. I'll buy a $1,000 eight core if it's the fastest, couldn't give a shit. But a lot of people don't feel that way. A lot of people feel like they wanna utilize their entire platform. So the best use case that me and the boys could come up with for these things were single PC streaming, right? What if we assign those eight little cores to OBS, use that for the single PC stream, maybe you can actually save some money by not having to buy a second PC, right? So this CPU here, the 12900K, it has eight big cores, eight little cores, and it actually also has an iGPU that you can stream off of and encode off of as well. So we have three different methods. So what I actually did for the results for this one was I created a dummy Twitch account, then I streamed from those various methods that we mentioned here. I streamed from those methods to the dummy account, then I downloaded the VOD off of Twitch from the dummy account, and that's the footage that you're actually gonna see today. So it was not a local recording, it was actually a genuine uploaded stream to Twitch. And I also included one webcam in there just because if you're streaming, you're probably gonna be using a webcam. I didn't go crazy with overlays and stuff. I mean, wh where does it end, right? So I did game capture, one webcam, stream to Twitch, downloaded the VOD. Okay, so let's go upstairs. I'm gonna show you the test setups, the footage, how it all works, and then you get to see, even in a best case scenario, is there any use case for those e-cores at all? Let's find out. Okay, so right off the bat, I'm gonna be showing you footage of QuickSync. This is the iGPU streaming. Now, the reason why I'm showing you this first is because the quality is absolutely horrendous. This is completely unusable. The background actually looks okay, but pay attention to the high motion areas, like the road right in front of the center of the camera. It's so blurry that you can't actually even make out where the road stops and starts. It's really, really, really bad. So anyway, long story short, if you are a single PC streamer, the iGPU on 12th gen is has zero improvement. So it's uh, using QuickSync is unviable for streaming. All right, so next up we have X264 Medium locked on the E-Cores only on the left. And then we have NVENC with max quality on the right. This was streamed at 1080p playing on a 3090 Ti max overclock. So you can see here that NVENC does take the FPS victory, 
and the quality victory here. Now, if we pause the frame here for a second, you can see that on the grass here, it's a little bit more defined, not much. It's not gonna make a break a difference for the uh, viewer, right? But uh, NVENC does have a little bit more quality on the grass here. And if you look at the board lines on the crate in the back here, again, it is better defined in these high motion areas. So NVENC does take the win here for FPS and quality. So there's no reason to use the E-Cores if you're streaming at 1080p, with a 3090 ti now that story does change when you go down to 3070 levels but we'll have to save that for another video so i decided to throw some apex legends in here as well and the story is kind of reversed now where the quality of x264 seems to be a bit better in high motion areas and the fps is actually also better with x264 medium so this game actually does hit the gpu a bit harder than warzone does so you'll actually maintain that 300 fps if you're cpu encoding but if you're gpu encoding you won't different tools for different jobs Okay, so now we're going to go back and check 1440p numbers. Now, the motion clarity on NVENC is still better, but now, now that there is more load on the GPU, X264 Medium is actually able to provide a higher FPS gaming experience now. So even the most powerful graphics card on the planet right now today is, is still not powerful enough to single PC stream with NVENC in 1440p. It's super interesting. Okay, with that information gathered and tested, we're going to head over to our friend, the spreadsheet. Now, the 12900K is the only CPU where this is actually viable. The 12700K and 12600K do not have enough e-cores to do this. You have to have a 12900K. Now, if you have a 2080 Ti or a 3070 Ti or below, in all instances except Overwatch, Valorant, and CSGO, you're going to want to use the E-Core streaming. These graphics cards get pegged at 1080p in all of these games. So you're going to want to reserve as much GPU horsepower as you can for the game. Let the E-Cores do the work. Now, if you have a 3080 or 3080 12 gig, 1080p Warzone and VEC because you just get those higher frames going that route and the game has a lot of headroom left in it with those graphics cards. X264 E cores for the rest. And again, for Overwatch, Valorant, CSGO, just use NVENC, turn the E cores off. Now, if you have a 3080 Ti or above, Warzone 1080p and Vic, just because you get the most frames doing that, you're pretty much pegging 300. Plenty and plenty of headroom left in those graphics cards to do that. Apex always x264 e cores. The Apex is just a weird game with graphics cards. E core streaming always works better with this one. Now, if you're doing Warzone in 1440p, you know, you can do either or here. You can do e cores if you want more FPS for yourself. Or you can do NVENC for quality if you want better picture quality for your viewer at the cost of 10 to 20 frames or whatever, right? So this is more of a personal preference type thing. Single players, the reason why I put X264 E cores for all of them is because in single player games, there's not very much rapid motion whipping the mouse left and right. So the E cores do a lot better with still frames and slow paced type of games, right? So you're actually better off saving as much graphical horsepower as you can to crank up those visual settings so that when the actual picture gets to the viewer, it has all of the bells and whistles and particle effects ready to go for them. And as always, Overwatch, Valorant, the easy to run games, just turn the E cores off, crank the NVENC on and you're good to go. So there you go. It actually works very, very, very well overall. Um, in Warzone, you get a little bit of a frame drop just because that game is so CPU heavy. And when you turn on the E cores, it robs a little bit of that cache, a little bit of that latency. But in games like Apex, Overwatch, Counter-Strike, these other eSport titles, 
no problems. You get full frames, full max performance, and you can stream on that thing. It's actually, it's actually wonderful. So here is the interesting thought now. With the 13th gen or 14th gen, whatever they call it, the next, with, with, with Raptor Lake, I want to say, they're actually doubling on the E-cores. So now you're going to have 16 E-cores. Now, bear with me for a second here. What if you disable 8 of the 16, you keep 8 for streaming, now the big cores have all of the cache of Alder Lake, plus eight e cores so i think actually the 13 900k or the next cpu that comes out that one might finally be a 100 percent no compromise single pc stream cpu we'll find out when the time comes but just an interesting thought to leave with you for now but if you're interested in streaming right now, this CPU does cost $200 more than a 12700K. You just get those four extra e-cores. But if you are an aspiring streamer, I think that it's worth it. Those extra four e-cores open up a lot of streaming doors for you, a lot. Now in some of those scenarios, those e-cores were hitting 90% usage on all of them, and I only have one webcam, right? So the limitation of this is going to be how intricate you can make your stream. If you have like three or four stream decks, a Go XLR, scene transitions, stinger transitions, if you have all that crazy shit, then I don't think the e-core streaming is gonna work for you very well, but that doesn't mean you can't just like disable four e-cores, leave four of them on, assign those to OBS to handle all the webcams and everything, and then you just use NVENC on top, that way you get the best of both worlds. But if you're just a gamer or you're going all into the streaming scene and you do have two PCs, then just turn that shit off, don't worry about it, because they just cause compatibility problems. Who wants to deal with setting CPU affinity cores all the time? It's a nightmare. You can, like, as with it, as with anything, you can make it work, but ease of use is a kind of a problem. But anyway, guys, I thought this was a huge success. Good use case for those e-cores. And if you like the content, hit that subscribe button, do all that YouTube SEO stuff, like, share, subscribe, comment down below if you can think of any other use cases, practical ones for those e-cores. Leave a comment down below. And I uh, hope you guys learned something, and I'll see you in the next one. Talk to you later.